Thank you. Yep. So my name is Steve Hutchinson. Call me Hutch. The single sign-on service leader for General Electric. Uh, I would just like to really quickly at the beginning point out a couple of my colleagues who are here because I'm going to refer to them during the presentation. First one's John Latenen. John is, uh, if you can wave your hand, John is our uh, SSO service delivery leader. John and I actually met at the Cloud Identity Summit last year. We convinced him to come work for us at GE. John's responsible for actually operationalizing and delivering a lot of the services that our service design team uh, implements. And speaking of the service design team, Patrick Looney, uh, Higher, there you go. Uh, Patrick is uh, just finishing a two-year leadership rotation at GE, and we're very happy that he's decided to stick around with the Web Access Solutions team. And currently, he's working on delivering, uh, securing some of our API endpoints, and we're going to go into a little bit of detail for that. Uh, also, this afternoon, I bring you greetings from General Electric's legal department, who requires me to let you know that the views and opinions expressed in this presentation are my own and do not necessarily represent those of the General Electric Company or any of its subsidiaries. So we'll just take that logo off of there. Uh, so for the rest of the presentation, I'm just going to refer to any generic enterprise, which I will refer to by its initials of GE. And <laughs> but it could refer to any Fortune 10 company founded by a famous inventor with half a million employees and is one of the leading uh, people in providing engineering solutions and financial services. So any company. Uh, also, I'd like to give a shout out to Daniel Hedrick, who is our colleague and dear, dear friend. And nothing raises the bar higher on your presentation than having your colleagues quote, used by the chairman and CEO of the company that's sponsoring the event that you're speaking at, and then uses that quote as the theme for his entire keynote address. Uh, those of you who are coming expecting the next identity is the new parameter are going to be sorely disappointed. Unless you are sorely disappointed is the phrase that you are going to look for. Also a warning, I don't know how many people here, this is your first uh, <laughs> visit to the Cloud Identity Summit. But if you're like I was last year, you're, you're kind of feeling this great sense of awe and euphoria right now probably think you possess this great magical flaming sword that you're going to be able to take back to where reality exists for you and you're going to be able to use it to cut through red tape and bureaucracy and you're going to plant it in the ground and it's going to sprout forth great new solutions. Yeah, maybe not. Uh, no, but what you are getting this week are, is to establish a vision. And you can use that vision to, to establish a goal. And if you can do something to nurture that, and whatever you're going to do for the next year until we can all get together again. Because you're going to find out that the, the power that that sword had is really generated by the knowledge and enthusiasm and passion of the people who are here. So it's really only good for about a five mile radius around the convention center. Um, but if you hold on to that, the tactical things that we all have to do in the business to get through the day and to get the, the business functioning, as long as we can keep that goal in our head, then those little tactical efforts are steps that we can use to get to that goal. So yeah, the solutions may not be as close as they appear when you're here, but don't worry. They may be a little bit closer than you think. Um, and plus, I just really wanted to have a Samuel is dead slide. <laughs> I, I know I'm about a year behind, so bear with me. Uh, but when I came into this role at GE, I came in in August 2011. And in August of 2011, we had about 40 SAML federations, which was great because the company I had come from, we had five. And back in 2011, SAML federations were still pretty complicated, not because the technology was complicated or because the protocol was complicated or not even because the team thought that they were complicated. It was complicated because it was the exercise of working with the service providers in the community. The service providers were not nearly as mature as they are today. So we weren't so much doing integrations as teaching SAML 101 classes to potential service partners to try and get the integration in place. Um, so when we heard in 2012, SAML's dead, great, you know, new things are going to come in. We thought this was going to ease uh, our adoption of these new federation services. Well, reality has a nasty way of slapping you in the face. Um, these are the actual number of SAML integrations at each point going through that we have at uh, GE. Right before we arrived at this conference, we're sitting just below 500 SAML integrations. And right up till a few months ago, all of those integrations were done by the same team of three people, uh, the same 
There were three people back in 2010 who were doing them, and there were three people who were doing them in 2013 when we crossed over 200. And the reason we were able to do that is because that market did mature, because now SAML is more like a configuration effort. Um, however, we can't sustain that. If we can't continue to see this spike like this, and we think that's going to continue, and because it's ubiquitous, and because now it's a configuration exercise, and it's not something we have to develop. But a few months ago, we partnered with our service delivery, the service design team partnered with the service delivery team to offer these services and have John's team actually do that integration, treat them as a standard integration rather than something as a one-off, which is what we were doing before. Um, this was my favorite quote from last year. This was Dale Old's uh, quote, said, SAML is not dead, it's done, which means that we can use it. And what he was trying to say was, SAML wasn't dead. And the, he knew what they meant when people said SAML was dead. There wasn't going to be a SAML version 3. There wasn't going to be any new development in SAML. But that meant that SAML was stable, that SAML wasn't going to change. SAML was something that we could build other services off of. And we've seen that over the last couple of years. We've seen that we're able to leverage it for new things, which is great because we have to move from our old infrastructure to our new infrastructure. Anybody who was at the FIDO 101 presentation, Rajiv had a great analogy when he talked about um, building skyscrapers. And he said, back in the day, people wanted to build their buildings higher and taller and more expansive, but they were limited by the tools that they had available to them. If you were working with wood, you could only build the building so high. Well, today we've got all the tools. We can build a skyscraper. It's not that we don't want to build one. And it's not that we don't understand how to build them. And we don't have the people or materials to build them. Our problem is we need to build this skyscraper on the same plot of land that we've built this giant wooden building on now. And we don't have the luxury of being able to raise this building down to the ground and then build a skyscraper up in the middle of it. We have to somehow build this skyscraper on the same piece of land while we're still living in this building which means that we need to take, you know, he said you could build a skyscraper once you invented the steel I-beam. Once you've got a steel I-beam, now you've got a structure that you can put up in the middle and build other things off of. So we need to somehow build the, those, that inner steel beam structure inside to be able to provide our services off it. And it turns out that we've actually got some really good steel I-beams to work with. So when we talk about going from here to there, let me share with you a little bit of where here is for, for uh, John and Patrick and I when we're working with this. This is a slide I use at GE to try and explain where I fit into the, the whole universe. It makes me feel better to be able to point out what I do. Um, basically, we, we take stuff that's derived from services from our SSO LDAP. We've got about 5 million accounts in there. Half a million of those are uh, active users, uh, employees, contractors, functional accounts. And to that, we add uh, B2B, B2C through our registration applications. Um, so if you want to do business with GE, you want to come in, leverage a GE portal, uh, you sign up for a GE SSO ID. And we populate you in a special branch in our SSO LDAP. We have three basic services that we provide. The first one is traditional web access management. And that right now, we're uh, protecting about 7,500 applications. John's team actually handles the integrations for probably 99.5% of all those. The service design team really only gets involved if something is really kind of off kilter, not a standard service. The, uh, the next one is Identity Federation. We leverage a federation product you've probably heard of. I've seen the name plastered up all over the place. It's like they're sponsoring the thing or something. Um, and again, for those 500 some federations, uh, we've been doing traditional SAML. And in the last uh, year since we last met at this conference, we've added in STSO auth and OpenID, much like everybody else is starting to adopt. And finally, we have our directory services. Uh, I'm very fortunate to work with a great directory services service leader. Uh, he's actually working, if you looked at this slide last year, that number would have been 450 directories that he was responsible for. We're launching a new virtual directory service, and he's able to, to start to collapse those. A huge simplification project for us. I think the goal is to get down to uh, under 50 of those uh, directories at some point. But those services really make up what we do. And the reason I really put the slide up here was to show you, if you take STSO auth open ID off of this and change virtual directory back to directory, if you were to ask me to draw this slide six years ago, it would have looked pretty much the same. And that's because the technology, the underlying technology that we had never really changed. Only scale and complexity changed. Uh, we were leveraging the same tools to do different jobs as we were going through. And the reason that we're doing that 
is because we work for a company that's built on perfection, a company that didn't just believe that they could drive to perfection, but actually proved out that they could do it, that you could take defects and drive them down to a point where they were statistically insignificant, which is great for engineering because you, know, you don't want your things to fail and to have the, your brand represent reliability is a wonderful thing to have. However, if you're working in software delivery or you're working to deliver identity services, it makes it the process to deliver a new service very long, very cumbersome, full of processes, and doesn't deliver in the time frame that your, your customers want it in. So GE recognized that, not just from our side, but from other sides. So they introduced something called FastWorks. And FastWorks is our kind of branded way of bringing in all of those new agile technologies and processes to bear. We opened up a brand new software center of excellence right up the road in San Ramon, staffed it with about 850 of some of the best minds in the software uh, development area. Most of those people coming from somewhere other than GE, which was great because what they did was they brought all that experience in from wherever they were before and not just to innovate and collaborate and provide that innovation for themselves, but they were able to take that spirit and drive it out to the rest of the business. So all of these agile technologies are now being pushed out to engineering, pushed out to finance systems, and to us in the identity space. So we started to change the way that, that we worked. We, we stopped going through these very enormous and requirement processes, and we adopted sprints, and we adopted daily stand-up meetings. And we, the bigger thing was we changed the way that our organization worked. Um, I'm going to go through some of the, the services. We've got some drivers that are driving uh, our identity uh, direction, which I'm, I'm sure are going to sound familiar to you, and I'm just going to go through a, a few of them right now. First one is moving data centers to the cloud. Our CEO uh, gave us a challenge at the end of last year. She wanted 50 applications, internal applications sitting in an internal data center moved up to uh, the cloud. And uh, we had chosen some online bookseller that we were going to use um, to run that service on. So we had, Dan, if you talk to Daniel, Daniel said we've always hooked our application development teams on the crack of web access management, which is we did everything for them. All they had to do was fill out a request John's team would put a, install the web agent on it. John's team would also go into the policy decision point, create the policy for you. You know, our team handled the authentication. All the application team knew is that magically, you know, in the HTTP header, they got a cookie that had an authenticated user, had attributes that they needed. Everything was wonderful. Well, now we're going to take this thing and we're going to push it up into the cloud. The other thing that we were challenged to do was, listen, if we're moving things up to the cloud, we don't want to just recreate our whole legacy environment up in the, the cloud. We want to cloud enable these applications. We want to teach these teams how to do authentication in the future. So we're not going to put the old infrastructure up there. So right now, today, we don't have a PDP up in the cloud. We're working on how we're going to solve that, but we don't have that yet. So the concept of an agent didn't apply anymore. So now these application teams that still have internal employees who need to authenticate um, to those services, but they didn't know how to do that. They, you know, all they knew was web agent. So we were able to take one of those great big good steel girders, which is our federation environment, which did have an agent that could talk to the PDP and did do things like convert uh, <coughs> session cookies into SAML tokens. Um, so we said, well, let's just convert it into a SAML token. Uh, we'll find a shibboleth plugin to stick on the, the web server. We'll do the redirect back to the Federation IDP. If they've already got a session cookie, we'll convert it to a SAML token. And here, application team, take this SAML token and go forth and be fruitful. And the application teams came back to us and said, we don't understand, where's the cookie? I don't know what to do with this token. What's the, what's, what's the token, SAML token? I don't know what that is. Uh, so our solution architect actually found a way to, uh, to take the, sh the same shibboleth plugin. We can convert the SAML token into a cookie that looks a lot like the cookie that they used to have and be able to push that in. But the reason I bring this up is not for the technology that we use to do that. Um, it's the, uh, the process that we used to, to get this operationalized. Because again, 50 applications was the goal. We did 50 applications in two weeks. But of those 7,500 applications, the goal is to get about 6,500 of those up into the cloud at some point. 
So instead of what we used to do, which was to come up with a solution, package it up, and then toss it over the wall to our operations team, we brought John's team in at the beginning, worked hand in hand as we went through the process to the point where today, John's team is responsible for these application integrations. So John's team works with the application teams to get that shibboleth plugin pulled in, and John's team is the one that does the integration with the, uh, the fe <coughs> excuse me, with the federated uh, IDP. Um, it was, again, it was a great partnership. It happened very quickly. Again, we were being tasked to do this in a very short period of time. And using the old practices of, you know, keeping those two services separate, we wouldn't have been able to do it. Another one that we're working on, this is kind of an example of where we don't have a, a touch points yet with the service delivery team, but we're working on bringing your own identity. In that previous slide that I had, I showed you, we have those four and a half million accounts that uh, we're forcing people to make if you want to come do business with us. Well, one, you know, consumers don't want to create another ID if they want to do business with you. And, and second, and, and more importantly, the, the last thing in the world I want to do is manage other people's identities. It's, it's cumbersome. They don't act the same way as employee IDs do. And it's harder to manage. So we want, to, we want to bring in, let you bring in some ID that you have from the the outside, but just like anybody else, we're having problems. If you come in with a Google ID, all I know for sure is that you have a Google ID. I don't know who you are. I don't know if the name you gave me is right. I don't know if you really work for the company that you said you work for. So, you know, we don't have this agent anymore. We're not talking back internally to the internal user store where we had that B2B branch. Instead, and this is another thing, the reason why Ian Glazer is so important in, in beating up on people to participate in things like the IDSG. It's because the IDSG is coming up with solutions. And one of the things they came up with was an end stick pilot to do attribute attestation. So we're actually working with a POC with an attribute attestation network provider where we can take people who come in and we redirect out to the attestation network, really let them act as the IDP where they present a NASCAR page, which I only recently understood apparently is a very bigoted way to, to put that up. So we'll have to work on that. But um, NASCAR page of uh, service uh, identity providers that we have done some sort of vetting with, you choose your Google ID, and that's great. Once you successfully authenticate in, then the attribute attestation network presents you with a form. And it's whatever attributes that we feel on the app this application team thinks that they need to have attested to. So it might be name, address, phone number, uh, maybe where you work. And then the attestation network goes out to a number of different identity sources, uh, DMVs, utility companies, LexisNexis, to try and confirm that. It comes back with uh, attributes that have been validated and have some level of assurance tied to them now. And we're, we're even looking at to take this to the next step. Again, another thing that Daniel had brought up was we all had identities before we arrived at whatever company we're working at now. So why, when I come into the company, I start working for a, a new company, do I have to use that company's credentials? I mean, we do it all the time here. I'm using my company's persona uh, for the most part. 95% of the time when I've been working and interacting here, I've been using the company persona to do it. Why can't I use my Google ID? So we're actually playing with that too. We don't have a, a particular use case yet, but we're, we've got a, uh, a POC that we're doing right now where in this model we'd be acting as um, not just the, the service provider providing the service, but we'd also be an attribute provider. Providing attributes or attestation for attributes for which we are the authoritative source. So you know, what my employee number is, what my uh, business location, the department, my industry group, um, who my boss is, all of those things are attributes that, um, that my company can attest to. So this is, a, again, not something that we currently have integrated with the service delivery team. We don't even have a point yet, but we know we're going to have to get them involved at some point. So it's important to bring them into that discussion as we're going. Even if we're going through design work where we don't have a particular use case yet, we have to bring them in as a partner. The last one I want to go over in, in a little bit of detail is the uh, API economy. Of course, everybody's been seeing this too. The APIs are growing expansively. All of our applications want to talk to other applications, leveraging APIs. Now, these applications are increasingly can be outside the network or inside the network. Regardless of where they are, we need to secure those endpoints. So we have an XML gateway, and that's how we expose uh, clients to APIs. So uh, we have a client who will come in through the XML gateway 
and we need to authorize them. So we actually talk to our federated environment. We send over the client ID, the client secret, a scope. Uh, we get back an access token, and then they can use that access token to consume the, the API. And the reason that this works is because both the, uh, the app team who is exposing the API and the client had to go through a registration process. The, the application team had to go and fill out a form and, and describe their service, describe what the endpoints were, what ports they were going to expose, the number of, uh, number of users they thought were gonna uh, come in. All of those things are then used uh, to, to populate records both in the XML gateway and into the SSO environment. Um, this is something that, uh, that Patrick has been working on. So Patrick is our design representative working with the, the different groups to, to, to pull all this information in to create this. Likewise, on the client side, the client also has to register themselves to, 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 to claim, here are the APIs that I want to consume. Uh, here's where uh, our application is coming from, the IP addresses, those type of things. And again, there's an SSO process that has to take place to get that information into the federated environment. Now again, Patrick is, is working on the part to design that environment, but he's been working hand in hand with John's team because again, this is something that, this is a good example of one that's a service that's in transition where uh, our service uh, design team is working hand in hand with the service delivery team because we can come up with what we think is the greatest process in the world, but it's not gonna work if you can't do it at scale and you can't do it with the resources that the service delivery team is gonna have available. Now, and, and I will admit that when we did this before, we just kind of tossed this over the, the wall. We, we would design them and say, and then we didn't understand when the service delivery team would get all upset with us about, well, why didn't you let us know that this was happening? We're not staffed for this. We can't do this. We don't even know what you're talking about. Um, a couple of other things, drivers that we got. We talked about the first three, uh, mobile devices being uh, access anywhere. Uh, right size authentication, this is a big one for us. So this is, uh, you can actually, at GE now, you can go to a site, you can register your uh, personal device, um, you can get a certificate pushed down to it, and maybe to the fact of having that, having that certificate is enough to get you to the corporate homepage. Um, but if I'm gonna get HR information, I'm gonna have to add my SSO ID and password. If I'm gonna pull access logs, out of Splunk, I might need a, a multi-factor ID. And if I'm going to go, if I'm working in aviation and pulling uh, engine blueprints, then maybe I also need to add network layered security over that. I can only get to that if I've done all those other things, plus I'm coming from some specific subnet. Uh, ABAC replacing RBAC, UX improvements. This is a big one for us. The, uh, I think our boss described it best, the goal of our department is to provide the world's most beautiful and elegant authentication service that you almost never see. Um, and then the industrial internet, which is GE's version of the Internet of Things, the, the concept that airline engines and, and ship engines and uh, wind turbines are all going to start communicating. If they're going to communicate with other systems, then they're going to need to have a sense of identity and a sense of authentication. So what were the barriers to offering these new services before? When we hired John last year, we were in two different groups, uh, operations and design, we both had our own we each had our own boss, they had their own boss, and it wasn't until we got up to their boss that we were able to even start to, to have information flow back and forth. It also meant that the goals and objectives of both of these departments were completely different and not always communicated back and forth at, at our level. So what we've done in the last few months is service delivery and service design are together now on the same team, we have the same boss, we're joined at the hip, we go to the same meetings, we're involved from start to finish, and, and all of those service delivery uh, engagements. And it's not just the two of us, it's you know, Patrick and design. It's, uh, we have program managers, we have um, product developers, we have software developers. Everybody is all involved on the same team. It makes communication easier, and it's because our goals are complementary. As a service design leader, my goal is to create change and add and modify features. And I'm getting that from feedback I get from business leadership. So it's usually the big things, the big features that they want to add. John's goal is to take those, those services that we're coming up with and create stability, making sure that those services never go down, that they're run in the most efficient way possible, that they, and we can speed deployment of them for the, the end user. And, but now we're also adding in, creating and enhancing services because we found out that one of the best feedback loops that we have is John's team, because they're the closest to the, the customer. 
They're the ones where when something's happening with a system or, or minor problems that we're going to need to take those issues and feed them into our backlog to create new services, they're coming from John's team now. Because in the end, we're both trying to enable the business. So just to finish up, the big wins uh, that we got from this, communication was huge. Uh, communication went from being very disjointed and infrequent to uh, now probably more frequent than, than John would probably like. Um, it eliminated finger pointing. The biggest thing is the entire team is engaged from concept uh, development all the way to, to service delivery. Everybody understands what all the pain points and choke points are all the way through. We have a, 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 the, a perfect feedback loop to get to figure out when we implement a service, we get immediate feedback on how that service is being rendered in the business. And the biggest thing was a huge reduction in cycle times. A perfect example of this, our reduced sign-on effort, which is a software product, to go from version 1.5 to 1.6 took 18 months to go from 1.7 through a whole bunch of areas, 1.7 to 1.8 to 1.81 to 1.9 took place in three months. And that was going through three different versions. So um, we've seen huge benefits in that. If you have any questions, Identity Hutch on Twitter, or you can use my email. Nice. Thanks very much, Hutch. Uh, we got time for one question. Yeah, give him a hand first. All right, we got one time for one question while we uh, get the next speaker up and, and change the deck. Anyone have any questions? Excellent. <laughs> All right. All right, one second. We'll get this loaded up, and we're off to the races. <laughs>